if you hear me coughing up a bone or hacking or anything over here, it's because <clears throat> I just chewed a uh, a bar that's like nuts, and it's great, but the only problem is it gets stuck all in your throat <clears throat> if you don't wash it down with a lot of liquid. So, at any rate, I hope everybody's uh, back here joining uh, the Mentors Military Podcast. Thanks for listening in, and I'm joined by my sidekick, Paul Martinez. Hey, everybody. And we got uh, some really cool guests here. Phil uh, Sussman, who's been on the show, I want to say, how many? Uh, you probably Two know the episode back. number. Two, uh, 170, 270? See, people are... Pro- That's awesome. When <laughs> I love, a lot. I, I love it when people... Huh? Yeah. Uh, oh, and 15 Perry Street. Thanks so much for reminding me of the, you know, the studio and stuff and allowing us to come here. Um, it, it's really cool for me when people say, oh, yeah, I remember, you know, because when I have them back, they're like, yeah, I was episode 172. I'm like, oh, that's so wicked cool that you know the number, you know, <laughs> and everything. That's like... Um, so anyway, welcome back. No, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and you brought your brother, Mike. So Did. thanks yes, for sir. coming here, Mike. Absolutely. Yeah. Co-founder of American Yogi. Oh, see, that part I didn't know. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> guy behind the guy. That's it. The shadow <laughs> governor of American Yogi. Right, yeah. right. And and you're probably the better half of it, I'm assuming. Uh, better looking. Better well, looking. I'll give him that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, for those who didn't listen to Phil's original episode, we figured that what we'd probably do is highlight rather quickly your past, um, because you had a very interesting one before you came in the Army. We were just talking about, and then, of course, you had the, the whole Army experience. So maybe you want to kind of share a little bit about that and why it was that you even came in the military in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was a photojournalism student um, at Boston University uh, a long time ago, and I went through two or three different, uh, different majors. I, was, I th- tried business, didn't like it. You know, I tried writing, didn't like it. And then finally I found photo and I loved it. Um, so I was in the photojournalism program and about 2006, well, exactly 2006, I decided to go to Israel. I wanted to be a, uh, a combat photographer and ended up, uh, a war broke out while I was there. Um, covered uh, the 34 day war uh, with Israel and, and Hezbollah up north. Uh, came home and decided that was what I wanted to do for a living. So I uh, got out of college. Uh, I, spent, I spent 17 months searching for jobs because the market crashed and it was rough and finally got a job out at Fort Lewis. I was a uh, contracted photojournalist uh, for the Army. I uh, spent a year doing that and I decided that I'd rather be doing uh, than watching. And that's when I transitioned and decided that I was going to join the Army. Uh, it was an easy decision at that point. Um, so I joined the Army. Uh, Went into the uh, the armor branch. I was a I was a cav officer uh, for a few years, and then uh. <laughs> <laughs> scouts out, <laughs> and then uh, made my way into special operations as a uh, as a civil affairs uh, officer, uh, as a team leader, and operations chief. Uh, recently got back from Syria in December, and been rolling currently in my separation from the army on my yeah. way out. Yeah. Um, well, that's another chapter in the life that you know we're getting ready to kind of dig into and everything because. While you were doing some of that, there was a passion that kind of bubbled up that you started the whole company that you now own with your brother, Mike. Absolutely. Yeah. So I broke my back in 2015. This is the part I left out of that last piece. (laughs) I broke broke my back in 2015 uh, in a training accident, uh, fractured L2, L3, transverse fracture. Well, you did talk about that. Wasn't that the um, the hatch or something? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That was when I was was trying to pop up and see a far target from a striker and my foot slipped, crunched on the back of the chair and it was was game over. Um, Thankfully, though, I I was able to finish proofing the range uh, for another two hours (laughs) with a broken back and then rode in the bouncing back of a striker for a couple hours and then basically spent the next two weeks on the couch. Um, and then uh, I, I went to rehab, and uh, my physical therapist said, just if you can take the pain, go for it. Uh, I was supposed to go to selection uh, two weeks from the point where I broke my back, pushed it a couple months, uh, did a hasty rehab, uh, went through uh, civil affairs assessment selection, and, and was rolling from there. And I found yoga in the mix. Uh, I guess that was 2016. Part, part of your therapy process that somebody recommended, or how, how was it? So my, my wife, yes, yeah, part of my therapy process, but it was my <laughs> wife that recommended it, and I, I resisted it for a while. Well, I, we all do. We talked yeah. about that, how funny, you know, that if you, how big it is today, and then not only that, but how big is it, it is today, even in the veteran um, space and veteran community, whereas there was a point where there was a whole male aspect, uh, there's no way I'm getting in wearing you, because they, you know, they yoga pants and the whole thing. They're thinking like the whole thing. Yeah, I'm not getting into that, you know, and then I'm not going to do it with a bunch of women and then I'm not going to do it for whatever other reasons and stuff. And then all of those barriers have been kind of torn down. I I absolutely agree. Um, 
you know, when, when I started doing yoga, it's, it was a totally different environment than it is now. You know, when I started a few years back, I was maybe one of two guys in class, maybe three guys in class. And now, you know, as a teacher, I could have 50-50 you know, easily. And we, we get group guys out there. We get conventional guys from 82nd out there. Um, it seems to be different, different by instructor too, though, I've heard. It is. So, so the, the way that I always explain yoga to people when they ask about different types of classes is, so I, I like to listen to hip hop. So I use that as, as my example. So there's hip hop. Somebody could say they don't like, they don't like rap. They don't like hip hop, but there's lots of different types of hip hop. There's, um, there's mumble rap, you know, there's, in, there's independent underground hip hop. There's the hip hop you hear on the radio and everyone is different. And you know, one tells a story, one, the beats are different. Same thing with yoga. Um, you can walk into a studio, there could be 10 different teachers and 10 completely different types of classes. Um, that's like when I started American yoga, uh, based off American, American yogi, um, I wanted it to be a completely different class than, than anything that I'd been to. And I was able to hone it during my six months in Syria where I was teaching people that had, that had never done yoga before. Um, so now I try to bring who I am and, and my experience into, into the yoga space. So I'll tell stories at the beginning of class and help get people uh, honed in on an intention or get honed in on something that, uh, that I work through that maybe they might, they might connect with as well. And then I just blast the hell out of some music and it's, it's maybe there's some hip hop in there. Maybe there's some folk in there. There's some electronic and, um, it's either your, some teachers are a glass of wine. Some teachers are a shot of tequila. So I'm, I'm like a triple shot of tequila in my class <laughs> you know? and, and the heat's like through the roof. Yeah. Well, I've heard that, you know, from people who have actually attended your um, classes and stuff. <laughs> yeah. They always show the photos of the sweat and everything. And, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, it's, it's really cool. No, I love it. Uh, there's nothing more cathartic uh, for me, especially as a teacher. You know, as a, I was a wrestling coach uh, a long time ago after I got out of uh, high school. And I never thought that I would get the same enjoyment coaching as I did as a wrestler, you know, winning matches. But then I found as a coach, like I got even more. It's the same way like as a yoga teacher where there'd be classes where I'd be in tears in class or I would have this amazing like groundbreaking experience in my body, in my mind. But now as a teacher and I can provide, I can still have that experience and provide it to others is unbelievable. So Mike, how, how was it that you got engaged? Did he just kind of drag you along or how did this, how did you get into it? <laughs> so I was going through something at the time, um, you know, some relationship issues and wasn't quite where I needed to be in life. Um, probably needed a, some sort of flame lit under me as well. Um, and having the business background was always looking for that thing that I needed to do. Not that I wanted to, but that I needed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it turn, just turns out that my brother happens to be the best business partner I've ever had. Um, and, and that and could I, always go awry, uh, right? I mean, it, it working was with family and friends, yeah. Absolutely. No, it was something that I, I never wanted to do. And, you know, in the back of my head, I was like, ah. Oh, working with family. I don't, mm. Mm. um, so when he approached, uh, me with this idea on a napkin, you know, kind of cliche, but, uh, oh, it was, it was legit, legitimately at the kitchen table on a napkin yeah. right, right after I got back from the yoga festival where the idea popped into my head where there was like 5,000 people and it was 20 guys that I, I kept, tried counting the guys and there was maybe 20 in the, in the whole, the whole group and not one product for guys there. Yeah. And that's why I had the idea. I approached my brother and we sat at a table with a napkin and, and pitched American yeah. Yogi. And, and it was born that day. You know, I had just gone through a divorce and it was just, it, it made sense to, to get involved in something and, and, and who better to, to get involved with. Were you with. a practicing yoga person at that time? I had started meditation mm -hmm. as a therapy post-divorce, uh, but the physical practice, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Um, so that, that kind of like the, the buffet aspect of, of yoga that he's talking about, you know, you take this, this day, you take this, this day, you know, um, that's kind of how I ended up finding my way into the yoga world. So I started with the business, um, the business side of it and the, just watching people experience it is really what got me into it. I, I was seeing mm. everything that they were taking out of it. And I couldn't help but join. I, I would also say that, you know, the same reason a lot of people find the practice and even become yoga teachers or some sort of, not everyone, obviously, but a lot of it in our community, we find it through trauma. Um, yep. You know, my brother as, as an EMT, having responded to Katrina, you know, he was on the ground in 9-11, like he'd been through his share of trauma as, uh, as in the EMS world. And I'd been through my share in, in, in the army world. And we became close kind of through that shared trauma. And we've, we've started healing together over the last, I guess, four years since we started the company. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible when I listen to some of the stories that he's had from his, you know, deployment experiences, not so unlike the 
experiences that I've had on my deployments. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, we talk a lot on this podcast around post-traumatic stress and everything. And we were talking, you know, before we got on air and everything about how EMS, and I would even say, you know, we talk a lot about uh, police officers, you know, I mean, they're, a lot of times you're going by the same trauma scene over and over again, whereas in the military, it's thousands of miles away. It's true. You know, when you leave deployment, you come back home, you're not seeing it. You may be driving by it every week going to the office. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting experience to wipe a room clean that some unbelievable trauma has just happened, whether it's physical or emotional or whatnot, wipe it clean. And then a, a three-year-old little girl with an, an earring stuck in her nose just needs to a little, you know, just needs to be popped out. And we just, you know, somebody just lost their life there 11 minutes ago. And that's what we're doing. You know, it's, it's, you wipe it clean and you move on. So the trauma of the military is not unlike the trauma in the medical world. And it's one and the same. Yeah. Yeah. 9-11, everybody, of course, knows where they were. They can, you sure. know, especially if you were alive during that time period, can pinpoint a time. Um, probably one of the most traumatic periods, I would imagine, you know, in experiencing that. For you, how has yoga benefited you in, in that and, and in this business? And it, does it kind of help heal you from even those trauma experiences of what you're seeing. You were talking about how you, you see the other experiences. I'm, I'm assuming it's also helping you heal in some ways as well. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. No, the, um, you know, the, the, the trauma after it was, was buried way, way down, way down for a long time. You know, I think the only thing that I had done for myself to deal with the trauma before that was, you know, kind of what anybody does, you get a tattoo, you yeah. know? So I got a tattoo years later, but I hadn't dealt with it. Um, you know, I wasn't sleeping well. I had these crazy dreams from then and, and, you know, all the uh, recourse that comes from something like that. The meditation part was really what got me there. You know, the breathing, mindfulness, um, journaling as well. Uh, so all, all of this is part of yoga. These are all limbs of yoga. The physical practice has been nice. Just, I mean, you generally, you generally tend to you know, feel better after you sweat, you know, so you release those endorphins and things just feel better. And that's what leads me to even further recovery. So it's just a, it's a vehicle. I, I could put, you know, a veteran t-shirt on you and no one would know the difference. Uh, for one, you got the cool operator beard, but I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm saying your experiences and what you're sharing are, I mean, it's exact same thing. And, and I think that's what a lot of times, um, you know, people feel like, well, I can't relate to you, you know, because I haven't served or whatever. No, you've probably experienced some of the same things that um, people who have wore the uniform have, have done and uh, have experienced. And in some cases, maybe even more traumatic, you know, and again, I like the fact that this, that you decided to join behind the mic because, you know, everybody may be listening to this, or there may be quite a few people who are listening to this who have some experience or something that's there and this is certainly one outlet or one way in which to start the healing process is what it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when he was even telling that story, uh, you know, one minute having a pretty traumatic experience and, you know, 10 minutes later, you're, you're in a completely benign uh, environment. You know, I, I instantly went back to a traumatic experience that I had. And, you know, we had a, a death that um, on an, an operation that I planned and then I was on the recovery team and then uh, we kept training and I had to go right back into the talk after bomb eyes out behind a vehicle and write, write an, or another order. And that's a, I think we're talking about the exact same thing here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just two sides of the, of the same coin. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, how has yoga, uh, or why do you think yoga has really caught on, uh, within the, the veteran community and veteran <sighs> space? <sighs> that's a, that's a heavy question. Um, I think honestly, uh, don't say Joe Rogan. <laughs> I mean, he's helped. Um, I, I think more people are, are feeling comfortable because it's like there's veterans and there's active duty service members who are kind of coming out of the yoga closet now yeah. and raising their hand and saying like yourself. Yeah. Like my, like myself, like, I, yeah. you know, people come to my class probably because I, I look like them or look like a normal dude. Um, and I'm, I'm raising, I'm raising my hand and saying, I'm, I do yoga. You know, I, I have, I have been diagnosed post-traumatic stress. I have been diagnosed with severe depression, uh, with anxiety. Um, and I have been very vocal about it. And I think uh, like, and I'm just talking about my little slice of the, of the, the yoga community. 
And I think it's helped there, but I think, you know, this last appointment when I'm seeing these jacked, you know, tattooed operators doing yoga and we were doing it very open and publicly where other, other people see that and they're not afraid to be seen anymore, you know, in that, in that environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's been the biggest shift. Um, and we're talking about it. You know, we're not, we're not relegating it to a corner of, you know, you have to look a certain way or you have to be a certain type of person or wearing a certain thing. You know, you know, we tell people all the time, like we, st we started the company so uh, we could give men an outlet, uh, for peace and feel comfortable because they're wearing a shirt that fits in in a yoga studio. But we always tell people too, like, you don't have to be wearing a certain thing. You don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to be in a certain you know, community. It's, it's accessible. And I think that's where the conversation is changing is people, people don't see it as, as taboo anymore. They don't see it as, uh, this, this huge wall to climb, you know, to, to access. I think, I wonder too, you made a comment about your introduction into yoga or at least the, you know, once your bro uh, brother brought it up and that was about the mindfulness, the breathing and stuff like that you talked about are kind of the arms or wh whatever term you use, Mike, in describing um, how it's connected to yoga that I think at times I wonder are an introduction that people um, may not even realize that how they're being introduced in that way. And um, because I think the military is starting to embrace it a whole lot more, especially before, you know, units go to combat or before you go down the range and breathing techniques and why it's so important and dealing with stress, uh, stress before you hit the X. And, yeah. and they're talking about it in those types of ways. And then I think it's, it starts opening up the parameters that would have not been there previously so that when a guy like you steps in and goes, hey, have you thought about yoga even on yeah. top of that? Like, ah, I'm not, you know, I'm not into big, uh, big into yoga. And then you go, well, yeah, you, you actually are. Yeah. You're already part of the way there. I, I think deployments are like the, the ticket to yoga is, is, is kind of how I feel about it now. Because when you're, when you're home, your home station, you have all kinds of distractions. You have, you have booze, you have, you know, people you can access anytime. But when you're overseas and you, you don't have much. Yeah, and you hit in the gym. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Th things are things are hard. You know, you're on mission and you're keyed the hell up, and then you get off mission. You need a, need a way to to unwind. Like that's when I had my, the most amount of practitioners. But when you're stateside, I found it's it's harder generally to get at least active duty service members that I it, that I know in my community into the studio. Really? Okay. So I was thinking that that was pretty much your bread and butter. Um, it, it is. But what I found is when you're overseas with the less distraction, like you, you can get them by the dozen, but people coming into the studio. But the same guys time. still won't go into the studio when they come back. Those guys will. Oh, okay. But it's because yeah. we roped them in overseas. <laughs> it was the old bait and switch. But they, you know? but they can't get their, their buddies maybe. Yeah. Uh, ex yeah. Because the buddies are probably still thinking, ah. And then you hit them again when you go to the... So it yeah. sounds like you need to deploy more so that you could... <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> literally the last thing I need. <laughs> put, put a big poster over there or yeah. something, American Yogi right there, uh, you know, some of the uh, fobs and stuff. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I've got buddies that... I always go back to this one. He, he was uh, one of my gunners, my first platoon. And I absolutely love this dude. And he supports American Yogi. You know, he, he wears T-shirts. And he's told me straight up, I will never do yoga. I will never go to a studio. And I told him, I said, that's okay. You know, I, I, you're part of the movement. You're part of the community. You're still opening the conversation up. You don't have to go to a studio. Like what my brother was talking about was the eight limbs of yoga. You know, <laughs> that's what you said. Yeah. Asana, asana, our movement, is one of the limbs. Um, so sometimes we get down on ourselves like, well, I should be moving. I should be, you know, physically in this practice, but, you know, sitting for a moment of concentration on what you're doing of, of one mindedness of mindfulness of, you know, just being in the present moment is yoga. A lot of people, we, we get stuck on the, on the physical practice and really it's, it's huge. It's everything. So how, how would you normally introduce the topic? And I mean, do you normally just say, Hey, you need to come try it out and see what it's all about or I think the first thing that I usually do is, is try to ease their their concerns that hey I'm not flexible enough or I don't know what I'm doing or any any number of, of not excuses but barriers yeah um, so that, that's what I try to address first you know like my class is I tell people whether it's your your first class or your your 500th class like you it's going to be accessible and you can take it where you want you can all, you've got the gas you've got the brakes um, so that's, that's what I try to tell people is that it's okay if you've, if you've never done yoga and step into studio, it's, it's okay if you're not flexible. Cause honestly, it's not even about the movements. I keep the, I keep the, the lights pretty low in class because I want people to just focus on the, of what's happening inside and the physical practice of yoga to me 
is just the ticket to the mind, the ticket to the soul. So is that why you think it's so impactful for people maybe who are struggling with trauma? A hundred percent. And a lot of, not a lot of it, but at least for me, um, I would say I didn't know how much trauma I was dealing with until I started dealing with it. And yoga is the outlet for that. You know, when I, when I was overseas, I was talking to my counselor about this the other day. I said, you know, when I was, when I was on mission, like I was, I was cool as a cucumber. Like no, nothing could shake me. I was, I was yeah. chill. Like we had to turn the jammers off to, to, you know, get a comms check or, you know, get a checkpoint, turn the jammers off, turn the jammers back on, never got worried about it, never felt. Um, I mean, obviously there was a danger, but I, I didn't let it shake me. So I thought like that was a great thing. I was like, I'm, I'm awesome. Like, I'm the man because I, because I stayed, I stayed chill overseas. But I got home and I was talking to my counselor about it. She said, you know, that's a, that's a stress response. You know, your body gets so overloaded um, with, I don't know if it's anxiety or information uh, of dangers that it's almost in that freeze phase or that freeze state. You know, f- uh, fight, flight, or freeze. But it doesn't feel like that. It feels like you're on um, hmm. when you're actually in a state where. Um, you're like, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say hyper aroused, but you know, something along those lines in a mental, mm-hmm. in a mental state. Um, so when I came home, you know, being able to practice yoga, it allows me to process that I can breathe through it. I can be present. You know, I can work on, you know, I like yoga in tandem with, with therapy, with, with counseling. So I, I've been seeing counselors on and off for years. The combination of talking to someone about the, the things that I've experienced and, being able to process it in the studio, whether it's meditation or the movement or the combination of all of that and sweating and being able to just let go um, has been the ticket to my healing. That makes sense because, I mean, maybe you're like me, but do you find like talk therapy or something oh, yeah. like that? Like it's exhausting. Dude, I, I do I do some woo-woo shit too. So yeah. like I do, <laughs> I do talk therapy. Yeah. I do sound healing, okay. which I mean, you, like bowls and okay. like rattles and tuning forks and all kinds yeah. of stuff. Like what? I'm open to everything now. Like, <laughs> That's cool. And, and I'll be honest with you, it has been life changing. Really? All, all that all that woo-woo now, stuff. Now is this your therapy, or are you talking about that you do at American Yogi? Uh, it's company. just therapy that I go that I go to. Really? So, yeah. See, so counselor. So what's like a what, like a sound therapy session like? So sound therapy, you, I do it laying down. So I lay down, lay down on a mat. Um, I like it so far. <laughs> the lights go low. You get, right. I get a, uh, a bean, like a beanbag eye mask on my okay. eyes. Um, I get sometimes a weighted blanket. Okay. Uh, I like to hold either a stone, like a, they call them worry stones, okay. like, a, like a heavy stone. that's yeah. like nice and smooth. that fits into your palm. Or I like to hold a mala so I can go through the beads. And then what she does is she plays bowls and plays chimes yeah. and plays tuning forks. And I'll tell you, sometimes like a, like a drum, um, I have gotten into the most like trance-like state. So the, the most significant experience. So we do talk therapy, but, but right. I also do a combination. So one day we were doing a, a sound session and she said she was really drawn to, to like thinking about my hands, like the things that I uh, hold in my hand and I've held in my hand throughout the years. And I started thinking about a buddy um, a, my best buddy that, that died and I was, I was with him for the last 24 hours of his life. And I had this picture in my head of, of holding his hand in the hospital um, as he was brain dead. And that image used to be really hard. I, mean, I didn't even know I had that, that memory in me. Yeah. Like the sound healing brought that up. And the combination with doing uh, previous uh, EMDR therapy as yep. well, so like the the bilateral movement, we do it with like a light a light bar. Um, I accessed my trauma, yeah. was able to transform it through talking, and then when it came to the sound therapy, I'd realized that because of the counseling that I'd done, because of talk therapy, that that memory was not like I used to shake. I'd be on yeah. the floor shaking bawling, crying, like balled up in the fetal position whenever, whenever we got into those really traumatic moments. But then through, you know, over time, I've been doing this, this uh, current block of counseling for the past six months, a couple times a week, uh, where that memory now of, you know, picturing that dude, my, my buddy's hand in mine was a, a neutral response physically, something that used to debilitate me. And that's, that's the combination of therapy and talk therapy, sound healing, yoga, yeah. I, I don't know that I've, I, it, of course, I've, I've heard of probably and seen, but I thought it was the hokey stuff. I didn't know what the hell was going on. But, I mean, yeah. the way you're describing it makes it sound like something that the average person would be willing to do. But but it, what? why is it 
why is it working? I, I don't understand the, the, the theory behind it. So, you know? so I don't, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't know exactly what okay. it is. Um, I know it, it is has there a medical response. Is it a true, that, really? from what I understand from my counselor, there is, and yeah. it, it plays a lot on, right. The you water in your body kind of thing. I don't or? know if it's the water. Like I know it's the nervous system that it affects a lot. So correct me. Parasympathetic versus sympathetic. Parasympathetic, Par- parasympathetic is the, the chill state. Mm-hmm. All right, so so there's there's certain like sessions we'll do that that are aimed at transitioning your nervous system toward and your 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 thought patterns into getting into a para, parasympathetic state, and I can tell you hands down, you know, from the beginning of the session to the end, like she's brought me from extremely anxious state, extremely keyed up state, like where there's days when I get just really jumpy, um, and it's gone by the end of the by the end of the practice by the end of the session. So I, I don't know exactly what it is, but I can tell you that me five, two years ago, five years ago, I never would have, never would have tried it. It would have been way too out there for me. Yeah. But now I'm just, I'm open to healing. You know, I've spent uh, 10 years just bottle, like, like Mike was talking about, like bottling shit up and just, just packing it down. And now being able to just be open to healing it, what, in whatever form, somebody comes to me and said, you know, you should try this, I'll, I'll try it. Why, what do we have to lose at this point? You know, I've always I've always wondered about the hesitation because I mean, sound therapy sounds a lot more accessible and easy than talk therapy. I mean, that's one of the reasons yeah. I chose EMDR when I was. I, I so what to, what is M? You said it both said it a couple of times. What is it? you you have a light bar and it sends like you track a light. You your eyes are supposed to follow it. Yeah, your head your head stays still. Your eyes. Yeah. Fall. Oh, yeah. just like they do with a doctor when he does a light uh, yeah. in front of me. Says you know on the physical or something. So this is a therapy. It's a therapy. Yeah, and you can talk during it about your trauma and stuff like that. I mean, it helped me get over you know a death of a good friend of mine, Michael Jenkowitz. Like I couldn't even say his name. I, I had no you idea. Know, just uh-huh. like you said, it's an uncontrollable reaction. It just would crush me. Yeah. You know, a bawling, sobbing, like biblical grief, and. Um, you know, I tried to talk to some people about it. It wasn't, didn't really work. So they said, well, we have this EMDR. And you look at a light. And I'm like, well, that sounds a lot easier than talking <laughs> yeah. to some yeah. shrink, you know. And then, But we did talk through it, and it works. You know, and it's, I guess, the mechanism. It's lateral eye movement is supposed yeah. to reduce some kind of trauma or and anxiety I think, effect. I think it goes, it's not only the eyes, but she's telling me if you, say, like, say you're driving, and you start to get keyed up, something she's t- told me to do is, I tap with my left hand and my right hand on the wheel, the bilateral really? movement, or you can just move your eyes to both sides of the road. Yeah. It's, it's soothing somehow. You know, she's even, my counselors also told me to do that with my kids. So my kids have, they get crazy at night when it's time for bed. So I usually ring a bowl for them too. And just them yeah. watching my hand go back and forth is, is calming. It's unbelievable. <laughs> like, and it, it's, it's scary too. Like, I, I don't know if you had this experience, but um, you know, she told me, she's like, you're about to be you know, deep in that traumatic event. Yeah. And you pinpoint it. She warned you before because she knew. Oh, yeah. I, I lived in it for like three days, my first session. Wow. Like I, I was in that moment. It was really, really hard. But then over time, it, it, was, it was life-changing. You know, it, it doesn't make it so the memory goes away. It, it tra- and tell me if you had a different experience, but it transforms the way that your body processes that memory. Yeah, yeah. That's, that was my experience in that instance. Well, I, I mean, I, I, what I'm hearing is that both of you um, are very much open to looking at different modalities in order to to help you know the healing process and and I and I think you're right I think there are a lot of people out there that they're searching for maybe the golden nugget but what what if you could get multiple ways in which to heal it in and it may not be one but it may be you're going to heal it you bubble it up first. And then you can attack it a different way. Yeah, it's like you're echeloning fires, right? Like yeah. you absolutely, you're just layering it yeah. on. I, th- I think that's, for me, that's what's been the biggest difference. Because in the past, I've just done talk therapy. And then this yeah. past like six months, I've gotten into like the real woo-woo stuff and, and including sound, th- sound healing and MDR. And it, like the combination, it's like, it's, it's life-changing. So so it sounds like you, you're kind of taking like a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Like a a more complex approach in the sense mm. of like it's because I think a lot of people and maybe it's Western medicine, but like you break your back, you take pain pills, you get surgery. Yeah. You, know, you have a trauma, you, you go talk to a shrink, you take antidepressants or anti-anxieties. Yeah. There's a, there's that's a decision there's, tree that goes into the process, right? But there's algorithm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not actual healing. Right. Yeah. And you know, I mean, all the, obviously those therapies have their place, but 
there isn't a magic pill. And, and sometimes what I found is, is people get frustrated and they just stop. Yeah. So like even the first time I started going to behavioral health a few years ago, um, I was, they put me on a ton of meds and yeah. then I had a bad experience with a psych yeah. and I stopped going yeah. and I went cold turkey on all my meds and I almost had a stroke. Like my, my, I was like, I was on uh, Klonopin, I was on uh, Ativan, I was on Zoloft and Jesus. they, they never checked back up on me. Yeah. And I just went cold turkey, and it was yeah. a it was a horrible experience, and I almost swore off uh, behavioral health altogether. Almost, uh, I almost said, you know, "I'm never going back." Yeah. But when I got into a place where I, I found myself struggling with, I start to I start to see like the data the data points in my head, right? I start, you know, checking the the blocks on. Okay, well, I'm experiencing this, this, and this. It's time to go get some help. It's time to step outside. And then, you know, I think I had one other experience before where I'm at now, and. Mm-hmm if I hadn't kept going to therapy, like kept trying, just like yoga, right? Like every teacher is gonna be different. Every counselor is different. They have different techniques. They, you know, like I'm going to physical therapy now because I, uh, I have arthritis, herniated disc, uh, growths on my femurs, like you, basically you name it. Nice. Um, I, I'm, I'm busted up. But my, my PT is developing a, a plan based on what he sees every day um, that I've never experienced with another physical therapist before. Um, so just like physical therapy, you know, your, your mental health, your, your talk therapy, your, you know, your behavior health counselor is going to have a different approach. Did you, did, do you ever look at it as maybe I don't need a PT? I already know what I need to do with my body because of all the stuff that you're, the modalities that you've used? Sometimes, yes. I, I can definitely see that occurring where it'd be like, I, I can heal thyself. You know, I don't need yeah. to, you know. Well, what's, what's great, though, is he'll, he'll say... You know, he'll do something. I, I've get, I get numbness in my hands. Like they yeah. just go numb. That's the like nerve. Con- constantly. Probably you got a uh, neck. Pinch yeah. nerve in the neck, right? So, yeah. so I got the same thing. It's terrible, it's, right? If you notice me shifting here, it's, yeah. it's the nerve pain. You know, I'm like, I have to pull down so I can open up the. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. It, it's, it's, it can be debilitating, right? Like I can't look over my shoulder. Yeah. But now I didn't know that I had a pinch nerve until I went to a physical therapist. And yeah. He was actually like feeling around and, and trying different things and testing out if he could stretch my neck and, and put oh, my neck back in place. <laughs> <laughs> but because of that, because no one had ever done it before yeah. until my physical therapist, like, okay, now I'm getting MRIs done on my neck. Like, so I, I think, you know, sometimes when you're doing the exercise, it's like, all right, you know, I can do, yeah. I can do an exercise on my own. But when it comes to the, his understanding of, of like physiology, his understanding of the body, um, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't do that on my well, own. Well, it's cool that you have somebody like that able to, to help diagnose, I mean, and figure out a way and a, and a, and a plan to help you come through it. I had a, um, a similar type of, I think, uh, thing happen a couple years ago when my neck injury flared up. And it used to be when it flare up, it flare up like, you know, maybe a day or something like that. And I just lay flat on the ground and sometimes not even a pillow and stuff. And then it would help and um, it would eventually just kind of subside. About three years ago, I was uh, traveling. I was in a hotel. I was down at the hotel gym. I was trying to rush my damn exercise, which I shouldn't have done. I was hungry. It had been a long day. I knew I needed to do something um, afterwards and work. And I was doing an exercise. Actually, I think it was, um, you know, something to do with my shoulders or something like that. And I lifted probably too much weight the wrong way, and I felt a pop. And And I thought, yeah. yeah. And I didn't feel pain, but I thought, oh. That, that didn't sound right. So I go back to the room, and my wife's a nurse, and I call her, and I go, uh, I think I just jacked up something in my body, upper body. I don't know what happened, but I got a feeling it's not going to be good. She goes, go ahead and pop right now, three Advil, and, yeah. you know, let's get ahead of it to mm-hmm. see if, you, you know, if there's any inflammation that's going to set in, because it's probably your neck, you know. And, uh, well, it wasn't just the neck. It had caused such a major pain. The next day, the forearms going uh, numb and, and my, my tricep, then my bicep, and then my hands. And it's, I'm in, like, debilitating pain oh, yeah. for weeks. And I finally, you know, I go to see the doctor because what I'm doing obviously isn't working. <laughs> And I see the physician and they say, oh, you know, hey, you just need to, you know, I'll send you to a physical therapist, but, you know, it's probably just something to flare up and we'll give you a, uh, uh, a shot and everything, you know, a cortisone shot. And I'm like, that damn thing didn't work the last time you gave me one of those. Oh, it'll, it'll, it'll work this time. Shoots me with the cortisone inside the neck and everything. Of course, you know, I about knocked him out because that thing hurts like all get out, you know, when it goes in. So fast forward, I meet this physical therapist who happened to have a PhD in physical therapy and also neurology, something, neurology, something, I don't know. Anyway, she's the body, the study of the body movement. Okay. She must've been something, yeah. you know, in serious. Cause I, I remember the nerve part of it. 
And she starts asking me a bunch of questions like a physician would. And she goes like, oh, you know, take off your shirt. Okay, turn around. And she's looking at my, the way I stand and, you know, my neck and everything else. And she's going, have you ever done this? And mama and starts running through this whole thing. Within like 20 minutes, she's like, this isn't your shoulder. This is your neck. And she goes, that neck injury that you had so long ago, she goes, the reason why you're feeling it in your thumb and this is going numb and that's going numb is because right where, I mean, she like connected the whole thing and she goes, um, lay down. I know what, I, we're going to try a few things. So she did a few techniques of like pushing down on, you know, like here and then putting a pillow up on, doing all kinds of different things. I walked out of there. I mean, it hit me a little bit later, but for like at least an hour, I was like, oh my God, the pain's gone. Yeah. You can move again. Yeah. And it was a physical therapist and not a physician, you know, and, and but we don't think about like yoga or a physical therapist or a whatever. We yeah. think go to the physician, get a pill, get a pill yep. and you'll get healed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, you haven't gave it enough time. Take two now instead of one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's like that's something that I've been working on heavily over the past year or so is, you know, we we, we always want to diagnose the symptoms. Right. We, and, and we don't actually get to the, the, root of the problems. Yeah. Right. And, you know, the Western versus Eastern style is is like night and day. Mm -hmm. And that where I always end up taking the conversation with with buddies when we talk about this is like the handling of, of death, even like the hand, like our cultural understanding of what of mental health in, in the West versus the East is totally different. You know, there it's it's a more it's a regular conversation. You know, there's you know the. What is it like Tai Chi and yoga and all these things? And, and I've always wanted to do Tai Chi. I can't ever find a place to do it. People think it's like for old people and stuff, but I, I just think the whole movement, you know, with the ball. I tried and, it years you know, ago. It's not bad. I it's, actually, it's all about breath. I used to actually take a VHS tape and with all my travel, slip it in, you know, uh, and try to play it. And then I, you know, I got it on a, um, my iPad and stuff like that and tried to practice it. And the, the breathing you know, the, the movement, you know, the pushing and pulling and all of that, it, it was very healing. It, it wasn't yeah. like, I don't know that it, maybe it was building up muscles. I guess in some ways it was, right? Uh, but I don't know that it was necessarily helping my injury. Yeah. It, and targeting that. But you were, you were subconsciously meditating, you know, whether, whether you knew it Good or point. not. Like you, you, were, you were having a meditative practice and like that heals you. That, yeah. you know, the mind controls the body like way more than we like to think. I would get I think, stressed sometimes and I'd shut, I'm sorry, Paul, and I'd shut the door in my office and actually do some of the Tai Chi movements before, and it would, would it would definitely center me again. I'm sorry. Go yeah. Well, you said something interesting, Phil. You said like you're in a meditative process, but I think a lot of people, you know, when they think of meditation, you know, you light the intense and you sit cross-legged on the floor in the dark and like, it's not. What, what is a meditative process like what, like so, you could just like define it yeah i mean I, I guess probably one of the one of the easiest ways to, to define meditation as far as making it like in a relatable way is anything that, that really you're doing with concentration and in the present moment it's, it's kind of how i try to describe it to people so um you can even meditate in a single breath you know i, I read i read years ago that the buddha you know there's buddhists that believe that you, know, you can you can achieve enlightenment you can achieve nirvana and you're, in, you're in talking a single about breath. deep single breath right I mean, a, a single shallow. breath. Really? A single breath. If you know, I've, I've never experienced like Nirvana, <laughs> but what what I will say though is, a single breath has taken me out of a like a hyper anxious state. You know, a single breath has has helped when maybe I'm about to say something or do something that I shouldn't. It brings me back down to earth, and I know there is science behind that. I heard I was at I was at a retreat for uh, the Mosaic Foundation a little while ago, and the resilience instructor. Uh, was an amazing dude. Um, he was an NSW guy, and he was talking about something about how when you when you fill up the lungs, it sends a signal to the brain. Uh, I don't know, Mike. Maybe you maybe you know a little more about about the the way that works. But um, I do know there is science backing up a single breath. Um, but to get back to your question, Paul, uh, with, with meditation, so washing the dishes can be meditation. Uh, cleaning your rifle can be meditation. Um, sitting cross-legged with your eyes closed and incense can be meditation. Uh, yoga for me is a moving meditation. Um, walking, if you, like when you walk, if you pay attention to every single step and you walk with intention, I'm intentionally putting my foot right here and I'm going to pay attention to when the heel strikes and then when the toe strikes and then I lift it up. That can be a meditation. You know, when I, when I started meditating, I would go to this group in uh, Manitou Springs 
Matthew Springs, I think it's called. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. In Colorado, when I was at Carson. Pretty there. And and I'd go, I'd go to this cabin, and it was all kinds of like old hippies, and me like this, you know, high and tight, you know, military, <laughs> military dude with a lot less tattoos at the time, but um, we would start the pr- the practice by walking in a circle for ten minutes. That was, you know, what I'm reading by this. If I started paying <laughs> that much attention, because I've already so, uh, I'm like a, uh, I don't know, over analyzer. Yeah. I'd probably cause shin splints or something like that to myself because I'm overthinking it in the way I'm planting my feet. <laughs> so I'm listening to this and I'm going, I don't know. If I that's want you to work try it me. now, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I really, like maybe we spend the rest of the podcast just like walking in a circle. And we, see, yeah. we see how focused we get. Um, yeah, that uh, meditation can be anything, anything you, you, that, you, that you're concentrate, concentrating on, like with purpose, with intention. You know, I read a, I read a scientific article the other day. It was a journal article um, that was talking about the fact that when you when we sit down for yoga. Uh, we always set an intention, at least in the way that I was raised in the yoga community. Um, and this article talks about this, this journal article talked about the fact that just setting an intention alone is already creating change chemically in your brain just by setting an intention. And then when you meditate past that, like I always bring my class to a few minutes of meditation before we start yoga, you've got the intention setting, which is already creating a shift in your brain. And then you've got breathing for a few minutes where Maybe you're still setting an intention, but you're also eyes closed, focusing on every breath that comes in, visualizing the breath come down, visualizing the breath come out of the body. And then when you start practice, you're, you're already a little zen out. Not to sound too. Yeah, that's like. <laughs> I'm going out there today. <laughs> you are. Like so let's say you're, you're cleaning your rifle. Like, what's the difference? Like, what's it doing if you're. You know, you're cleaning your rifle, you're thinking about the bills, you're thinking about the last mission, or you're, you're like not really focused on the task. Like we know there's so many things you do automatically. Yeah, and, that, and that's the point. That's, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's not doing those things automatically. Okay. It's doing those things with, with purpose and intention and, and um, paying know. attention. Because like you can eat a whole meal, right? Mm-hmm. And forget you yeah. ate. Like you didn't even pay attention to, yeah. to the meal. But Oh, I've been driving and go, holy crap. Saying, that's I the other drove two miles and I didn't. Yeah. That's scary when I do that. It is, but you can meditate. Like if you if you if you're consciously breathing and you're you're paying attention to the to you know the road and your environment around you. Like what I tell my yoga classes is, uh, find three things to ground you in the moment. So maybe it's the heat of the room, the sweat going down your head. Maybe it's uh, the beat of the music. Maybe it's the feel of the mat under your feet. Those three things ground you. They give you an intention. And they allow you to, to be grounded in the present moment and you're fully aware of what's happening around you. You can do the same thing while you're driving or washing the dishes or cleaning your rifle. You know, I'm, I'm putting the CLP, you know, exactly this much CLP on my rag. And now I'm taking the rag and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean the mag well or something. Yeah. And you're, you're intentionally cleaning the left side, then the middle, the right side. So anything that you do that you're focusing on, absolutely. I mean, I've included. And what's, the, and what's the benefit of that versus doing it automatically? What, like, what are, you, what are you accomplishing? So that's... Kind of, during that time, you're, you're not thinking about the bills. You're not thinking about your, you know, taking your dog out or, you know, how's, how's this mortgage going to come through or should I buy a house or should I fix my car or whatever? So that time, it's like he's saying the the distraction, if that's what you need it for, if you need a distraction temporarily, that's what it's for. Then it just becomes part of your routine. Right. So that's the same reason that the EMDR or, or any other kind of biofeedback works. Right. So it, it's distracting at first, and then your body realizes, wait, I, I don't need that in my head all the time. I don't need that constant, you know, broken record track. It's the same. They use EMDR. They use biofeedback for concussion for TBI. Um, so that, that's why that works. I mean, or, or I know for me, like I could be after work sometimes, I guess last year before I deployed, I'd be so stressed out. All I'd want to do is, is chug a bottle of whiskey. Um, but I'd go to the yoga studio and I'd meditate. And as I go through my practice, I'm intentionally putting, you know, a foot here. I'm intentionally bringing my arm there, paying attention to the body, paying attention to the mind. I come home and I don't want to drink. Mm. I'm listening to this and I can even remember um, somebody who's been on the podcast in the past posting uh, photos, uh, especially this last little segment here, posting photos, you know, on social media where they went on a long flight. And the first thing that they do whenever they get to where they're going is to take their shoes off and plant their feet in the ground on the grass because the way they described it is it it connects you it grounds you and whatever you know the plane and the kind of the toxins or whatever the, the way they described it sounds a little hokey and 
It's called the earthing, I think. Is it? I, yeah. might, be, I might be wrong. Yeah. Earthing, yeah. grounding. Something like yeah. that, yeah. I've heard of it. I've never, I mean, I like being barefoot, but yeah. I wouldn't say I have like a yeah. regular practice of that. Yeah, this person does. Yeah. And yeah. even does it in the airport, you know, and stretches and everything when they're waiting for the plane to board. And, That's awesome. And, I would join yeah. them. If, if I was like, if I, when I flew in today, if I saw a dude in the airport doing that, I'd, I'd go over and talk to him. Yeah. And okay. I'd, I'd, I'd probably join. I think, aren't there airports now that have yoga rooms? I think Chicago. Do they really? They have smoking rooms. Why not have yoga rooms, right? Why don't you convert all the smoking rooms? (laughs) There you go, right? (laughs) You'd have healthier people. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) No, I didn't hear about that. So, I mean, maybe some do. Yeah. I I feel like it's Midway or O'Hare. It's one of the Chicago airports has one. Okay. It's right under the uh, breastfeeding room Mm. or something. So, yeah, no, it's helpful. I mean, the, the, the breathing, getting back to the breathing, too, there is a physical part of that. It's not, it's not just the breath entering your body. When you breathe and your diaphragm changes its position, there's a nerve that connects your diaphragm directly to your brain. It's called the vagus nerve. You know, so when you're breathing and the vagus and the vagus nerve is doing what it's supposed to be doing, the diaphragm's going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down. As it's doing that, it's also sending the same message back to your brain. Hence the biofeedback. So that's, that's kind of why that works. So whether it's one breath or whether it's cleaning your rifle or doing yoga in the airport. Mm. That's why that works. I mean, I, I know. So when I went to the selection, I had, I, I guess I was a few months into my, my meditation practice. This was, I don't even remember if I had a yoga practice when I went to selection, but I know before every event of selection, I, I would close my eyes and I would take a few breaths and whatever nerves I had by the end of it yeah. were gone. And I was completely okay with whatever happened after that. And I can't explain that. I'm not a, you know, I'm, I don't, I don't understand the brain. In, in any way, shape, or form, but I can tell you that tangibly, it it works. Hmm. No, I, I mean, it all sounds, I mean, obviously, I'm going to take your word for it that it all does. <laughs> and I can totally see that it's it's working because people are going and experiencing it, and I'm beginning to see it more and more, like I said, in the community, more than ever, you know, and people yeah. are embracing it as a, a form of, um, healing or exercise or a combination of both, you know, you know, they're looking at it for many different, like I said, modalities or different reasons and stuff, or they they may be in the case like you guys are where, you know, they know that they tried counseling and that fixes some aspect of it, or they did, um, still at ganglion block and that may have helped in a different way. Yeah. And then they went to, um, you know, mindful meditation and that helped And And I mean, why not? It, w- Why not put all those tools in your toolbox? Exactly. I, I, I think I think you hit the nail on the head too when you're talking about different modalities and people with different backgrounds. You know, what I think about too is that people, no matter their injury, whether it's an invisible wound or whether they're missing a limb, like yoga is the great unifier. It's how how I usually describe it to people. Like you'll see people of all shapes, of all sizes, of all colors, like in, in that room experiencing things together. And you know, with yoga. Um, what I found with my both uh, mental issues or behavioral health, whatever, mental health issues and, and body issues with my back, um, that yoga has allowed me to access both. Now, it's hard walking around, especially in the Army, when people can't see that if you're missing a limb. You know, they, they can't see your, your wounds. And I think it's really hard to explain to people that you're in pain all the time. Um, but when you go into the yoga studio, you know, we're you're in a room with people from all different backgrounds with, all, with you know, different, maybe some, I'm sure some have no ailments, but we all bring, you know, whatever ailments into the room, but it, it really doesn't matter because it's the yoga is going to do the work. You know, you'll, you'll have your experience of it, but at the same time, no matter what's going on inside, like you can find a place there. So what if you have people, you know, like we were talking about, we all end up getting broke in some way by being in the, the military. It's just, part of the, the process, you know, and the longer you stay, probably the more broke you end up getting. And I mean, how do you approach it where people come in the studio and they go, okay, I'm willing to give this a shot because one, I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll see if the hokey side of this works from the mental standpoint, yeah. but maybe physically I need this from a physical therapy or exercise standpoint. What if they're broke, but they're not sure if they can do specific exercises or if they should, but yet it may also heal them. Yeah. Do, do you got like, do you have an opportunity? Well, before you can take a class, here's a, you need to have a one-on-one and a counseling session to get that information to make sure, or you just say, Hey, if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Or how do yeah, you so, approach that? So I think 
we have informal counseling before before yoga. I'd say like verbal counseling, if yeah. you will. Because um, if there's a new student to the class, a lot of times I'll talk to them. So you know, welcome to, welcome to class, or or they'll come down and say, "Hey, it's my first time doing doing hot yoga," and we'll have that conversation and say, like, you know, where is there anything you can't do? Is there you know, is there anything that that hurts when you move a certain way? Um, but a lot of times I don't get that opportunity. Um, but just how every teacher is different, right? So I teach to where my body's at, and my body is very restricted. Uh, so I offer. A, a variety of modifications or variations for literally every pose that I bring my students through. Now, not every teacher is going to do that, but based on my experience, like my, my physical experience of the last few years of being in such pain and having to adapt my practice that even if I don't have that conversation with that person, I'm going to offer enough variations in that class where they can find something that works for them. And then if, if we're in class and I see that, you know, maybe they're struggling with, with one thing or the other, I'll give a, a broad set of instructions to the entire class so that that person doesn't feel singled out because it's not about that person. Mm-hmm. It's about the class. Um, and I want everyone to be included. So I'll, I'll give a cue that that person can pick up without feeling like, oh, I'm different or I can't do this. So post-traumatic stress, I want to kind of go down the path of, you know, now taking the mental side of this, you know, we talked about the physical and the mental part of it, but um, there's such a stigma, you know, around post-traumatic stress, especially if you're within the military that you don't want to come forward and talk about it. Maybe it'll get to a point where they don't even want to, you know, if you go to yoga, maybe you're being labeled as, oh, you know, hey, if you're doing yoga, that means there may be something there. You know, you know what I'm talking about yeah. is that, you know, oh, hey, he showed up down at America, uh, American Yogi. So yeah. maybe, you know, I, I think I think you're I think you're exactly right. Um, you know, I, I've had a similar experience. You know, when the first time I went to therapy years ago, uh, I went off post because I didn't want to be labeled as someone who was going to a counselor. And then that was kind of my gateway to starting to get help. The next time I, I went and sought out help, I talked to the uh, they call Miflix, the, the military family life counselors. Um, they have, I think they have them on every post and it's, it's completely anonymous. Like your command, your command is not in the loop of it. You get like, I think five or 10 sessions with a, with a counselor. Um, cause once again, I didn't want to be labeled as someone that was, I didn't want to come on the, on the blotter on the radar of the command It's like, Oh, so, you know, Phil's going to uh, therapy. So maybe something's wrong with him. Maybe we, you know, maybe he shouldn't be trusted with yeah, X, Y, or Z. And then you're scrutinized. Exactly. Well, that's what I was talking about. So all of a sudden, Oh, I see you there. Yeah. So, so I, that's what I was worried about. Like, that's why I didn't, I didn't go seek a proper therapist, but there came to a point where I just needed it. Um, so once you cross that threshold, the hardest part is like looking at the threshold and saying like, I, I'm going to go talk to a therapist and I'm going to do it in, in the army system or whatever branch you're in, in that yeah. system. And you know, your name is going to be on some sort of list somewhere. Um, and that was the hardest thing for me to swallow that, I knew that my command, that my leadership was going to know that I was in therapy. So what, what was that going to change? And what I found out really quickly is nothing. It changes nothing. And I've been going to therapy on and off. Um, you know, psychiatrist, which one can prescribe meds? I always forget. Psychiatrist. Yeah. Psychiatrist and counselors like, uh, LCSWs licensed social workers. Yeah. Social workers, um, for the past five, six years, and I've deployed multiple times in yeah. special operations like in talks and AOR, like no issues. Yeah. You know, I've been on a variety of meds on and off, um, and I had a successful career. You know, now I'm on the tail end of it now, but... Would you have had that successful career if you didn't seek mental health? Like, I don't think so. Able to keep it together? I don't think so. I think I would have... I mean, yeah, probably, like but I would have struggled like hell. Yeah. I, I would have... It, it would have been even more painful. I mean, it was, it was hard. I mean, you know, yeah. you know, like pre-mission train-ups are brutal. Like they're, they're nonstop, especially my last job as an operations chief. You know, I was working from, from morning till night. We were going TDY constantly. I was training constantly. You're in that, um, that like, I don't want to say hypervigilance, but you're like keyed up all the time because you're, yeah. you're just ready to go. Um, and I had some really tough nights, but if I didn't have at least the outlets that I do, it'd be even harder. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like I drink a lot, Yeah. you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm human. You know, yeah. I spent, I spent plenty of nights in a bottle, but now I've quit drinking. This is, if I hadn't gone through all those things and, and sought help along the way, I don't think I'd be where, where I am open to the, the different modalities that I am now. So I, I would love to see the stigma lifted. I think if yeah. more people knew that nothing is going to happen to you, like your, your counselors, you know, at least I'll, I can only speak to the army system because it's the only one I've been in. 
but your counselors are not going to go to your command and talk to them about the things you're talking about unless they're unless there's a serious concern. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, it's it's open, it's there, like, and it, it's life changing, and it could it can really, I mean, because my marriage was was in a really rough place a few years ago before I started meditation, before I started yoga, before I started seeing ther- like therapists, like yeah. talking about writing about the birth of my first daughter. And I was in a serious depression, like to the point where I, I told my wife, I said, I know I love you. Yeah. I know it logically, but I don't feel a thing. I'm sorry. I don't know what yeah. to tell you. It was, it was depression. It was grief. Yeah. Um, if I hadn't gone to a counselor, I don't know how I would have overcome that. Yeah. So. Mm. Well, I think I, I would like like you, obviously, I want the stigma to be lifted, but it should be encouraged. I mean, you're you're going down this road where you're. These aren't highway miles. You know, you do a military career. You start when you're 18, 19 years old. By the time you're 30, you may have as many dead friends as your 80 year old grandmother. Yeah. That's the conversation I had. You know, we're like talking about people, places we've lived, and people we've known. And you know, she go and I had these neighbors here, and they were fun, and we went and did these things. But you know, they've passed away. And I'd be like, yeah, and I had this buddy, and you know, but he's gone. Yeah. Or, you know, they took their own life or whatever. And you realize, like, that's a lot of death to be packed into, you know, 10 or 30 years. And then you think yeah. about, like, the things you've had to do. You know, I mean, there's a lot of moral ambiguity, and you're just carrying it around. And you're, yeah. you're not supposed to go and talk to somebody whose expertise is in mental health. That doesn't make any sense to me. No. Like, it should be encouraged, and I think it should be taken as a Like, if you're seeking mental health, that means you care one about yourself and one about whatever unit you're in and whatever mission that's supporting because you're trying to get better and you're trying to maintain that edge so that you can carry on and be effective. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense to me that that's not the case. And I think there is a big shift. You know, we talked to a lot of senior guys, sergeant majors, first sergeants. You know, I was just talking to my buddy uh, Belford. He's a first sergeant down at 75th and he held a formation and introduced his count like he brought his counselor that's cool to formation he's like i've had a relationship with this woman for five years or four years i don't i don't remember but years and he's telling his privates his, his pls his you know platoon sergeants he's like i don't this is how i get it done this that, is how i've been able to have success that's how the conversation is going to change exactly i mean that's saved my life i had a first sergeant first sergeant anderson i was at the same company that belford's the first sergeant of now and he held a formation he's like my children are feral i'm an alcoholic uh, me and my wife are, you know, on the rocks and it's because I'm drinking too much and I'm not addressing these things. Yeah. And he's like, you can only do so much PT and go to the fight gym so much. He's like, I'm in counseling and anybody who needs it, you can get it too. And you will still be standing in this formation when you're done. And that I wouldn't have sought help as soon as I did, if it weren't for him. And it probably saved my life. There aren't as many active duty voices, I think. And it's improving, but there aren't as many sure. active duty. And there hasn't been until probably recently very many veteran voices actually yeah. talking about it because there was still fear of the stigma, to, a stigma on the outside, you know, of how they were going to be perceived. And we talked about this in other episodes, including earlier, but, you know, uh, are civilians then going to view them as broke? and you know not want to hire them and or somebody that's a risk in the business in the workplace same types of perceptions maybe slightly different than even uh what the veteran space is you know when they're when they're i mean on active duty space i mean when they're on active duty so what they end up doing is just being silent through this whole thing but when you start seeing like you know people on active duty like that coming forward and then you hear the veteran voices now going with guys we can't do this anymore I think it is start. There's a movement happening. I I, I agree wholeheartedly. You know, the, I was in uh, that retreat I was talking about. I, I taught a handful of uh, Marines, uh, veterans from the Battle of Fallujah in 2004. Those dudes had never, done, most of them had never done yoga before. Had never done any mindful mindful practice, you know, mindfulness, meditation. Um, and then you know when I was talking to them, you know, kind of the off time outside of yoga. I was asking them about like their VA experience and mental health. And, you know, even just a few years ago, you know, there, there was extreme resistance to it. And like, you know, these, these guys are some of the most amazing dudes ever met. And, you know, they've been through a hell of a lot. Yeah. And there was a stigma even for them to, to go to the VA and talk about post-traumatic stress. And I mean, we're not talking about that long ago. Yeah. You know, and even from then to now, I feel like there's been a massive shift. I mean, we're not Huge. there, 
but yeah. we're definitely uh, we're definitely getting there. And yeah. and I think I feel like our our community, you know, the greater society as well, but definitely our community is hungry for authenticity. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, they're hungry for for voices of, of of honesty and truth about kind of what we all go through, and so so we know we're not alone because especially with social media now, you know, while we're more connected than ever, we're also more isolated than ever. And then, you know, you look at the past year and a half with COVID, you know, I, th I think, I think just being honest and, and being real about the things that we're dealing with, especially from senior leaders, like it doesn't, yeah. I mean, I remember as a team leader, like I sat down with my team and it was a four person team yeah. and I told them I was honest with them. It was like a brand new team leader. And I was like, that's what I'm going through. Like, just so you guys know, you know, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I've been dealing with for years. They didn't know how to take it. Yeah. They didn't know what to say. Um, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe down the road, like one or two of them sought some help when they needed yeah. it, but you know, I'll never know, but I never regret, you know, I've told my, from my very first platoon, I always tell, I always tell them like, I, I value honesty more than anything else. I don't care what you do. Just, I mean, I do care what you do, but right. if you're going to do something, just be honest with me about it. And I, I just like, I would expect that from my guys. Like I, I'm going to give that back. Did you ever tell first Sergeant Anderson? No. Yeah. Oh. I've got him so, on Instagram. So yeah. see, you, you just may never know. Yeah. And, but you know yeah. what? It doesn't matter because, you know, it, it may happen. Yeah. And, and if it did happen, great. But it's not like you need to go find out if it happened. It's just, it's just be yourself, be open, be honest, get yourself out there. It's really hard to do, and it's hard to put our, our bag of luggage. I mean, our generations before us, you know, we're only talking one or two generations. They were called the, the silent generation and those types of things because they held things in a lot. There are dirty secrets that oh, are yeah. out there that, you know, people don't want to know that's in the closet and such, you know. But I think it, um, there's a lot of good that comes out of, you know, us actually talking about things. I mean, social media, you know, it has its faults for sure. But it can also be a healthy um, medium, you know, that's out there that allows people a podcast. You know, yeah. it was another opportunity where you're starting to see a lot more people come out and expressing their voices and getting the message across. And I mean, there, there, there's ways you can find, I guess, negative or positive, whichever yeah. way you look at. But no, of course. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like our social media for for American Yogi. Like I'll put I'll put poems on there. Dude, you put I, some I write deep poetry, stuff. I love you know? it. Uh, you put some deep stuff. Some some stuff I've got to like scratch my head sometimes. You know, because it's yeah. like. I may not even be able to relate, but I, I look at it and go, damn, that's like, whew, that's deep. Yeah. I mean, I, I put, I put every bit of myself, uh, into it, you know, that, that, uh, the writing that I give or that I put on, on social media and, you know, the yoga classes that I give and podcasts, like whatever I do, like I do, you know, whole last and I do it honestly. And I think, I think that it's cathartic for me. It's also a little scary sometimes, you know, to, all right, writing poetry. Yeah. And putting it out into the world as a as a man, as a veteran, or I'm not even a veteran yet, um, is it's it's vulnerable. You know, it's, it takes a lot of vulnerability, it's and it, oh, it's yeah. hard, big time. That's really but, hard to do. But what I found though is I've got dudes from from Bat that reach yeah. out to me. I've got dudes from you know from the SF community, from from the regular army, like, and they all reach out and they they they're like, man, what you wrote the other day like really impacted me, and. Because of that, like we were talking about before the show, like maybe because of what you wrote, I didn't put a gun in my mouth last night. Mm -hmm. And like I've gotten that message, you know, a few times. And it's, you know, on the one side, it's it's hard to see things like that because I I've, I've been in experiences with with my buddies that have put guns in their mouths, and it's really hard to see, yeah. and it's really hard to um, like to carry. Yeah. But to know that there's people that are reading these things that are that are pretty deep and personal and feeling a connection with it. And maybe that keeps them from from doing something dire. Yeah. I'm going to keep writing poems yeah. and putting poems on the internet. Yeah, know? that's what keeps us going here. Yeah. You know, and doing yeah. the podcast is quite honestly those types of comments, and not just those comments, but any kind of positive comment that way. It says, "Hey, man, you you know, you guys are making a difference." It means a lot when we get that feedback from individuals. And you know, when I read the you know some of your poems, well, first off, like you said, it's one thing to write a poem, which people can auto automatically just tear apart because you didn't do a rhyming technique the right way yeah. and, or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. They get, they, you know, like they do in a photo of like, why is he wearing that in that photo, yeah. you know, and all that kind of stuff. It's like, dude, you, you totally missed the message. Did you read anything <laughs> below that, yeah. you know? But I mean, yeah, the, uh, people will find ways to tear it apart, but I really, I, I appreciate um, and it's one of the ways I was telling uh, Kelly Roby, as a matter of fact, who was a, a earlier guest, that 
I really appreciate those individuals who take the time to share a message that goes beyond just a photograph and it's a positive message of healing of hope or whatever the case may be or just a raw emotional message that goes out there and it's quite frankly one of the ways this podcast started because I would like be surfing through Instagram and maybe you know I was connected to you Mike but then you know, somehow I saw in the search button, you know, your brother's photo, and then I read the the thing underneath it, and it'd be like, holy crap, I got to get Phil on the podcast. <laughs> because then, you know, you're being the type of person that I want on the show that is going to be vulnerable, willing to be vulnerable, willing to share that kind of message um, that people quite honestly need to hear. Yeah. Uh, right now, that's it's it's the positive thing that we need to really put out there. And I'm talking about whether it's veteran, yeah. whether it's you know civilian or you know um, active duty stuff. You know, we've especially active duty. We we've, we've got to get more active duty understanding that it's okay not to be okay. Well, yeah. I think I almost think you should be you should be kind of proud of your trauma. Like the the kind of trauma that you get from our line of work, you earn that. Like you you don't. People think oh, I've got to go talk to a shrink, or I've got to do yoga, or I've got to do whatever kind of therapy I'm doing, and like that's going to make me a pussy. It's like no, man, it's the opposite. You have this trauma because you were a badass enough to go and do the hard thing in the first place. Yeah. You don't get to this point where you need to do this much self care and seek out these these therapies without doing something really hard and admirable and and you know masculine or brave or whatever you want to call it, like. You don't get that by sitting on the couch. That's an awesome you know, way to put it. Yeah. You know, like you, you earned this. There's only one way to get it. So don't feel like you're less of a man or you're not as tough. Or you're but I think weak. that's the whole thing. It's not to them. It's not a badge of honor and they struggle with that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because we're taught really to, to show the trophy, you know, to, to sure. wear the badges on our uniform yeah. of the things, you know, and, and yeah. this is not one of those things we want to like outwardly display. It's not like, you know, you're going to get a tra- Even if I gave you a badge and said, you know, th- thanks, Phil, for going through the therapy and for getting yourself right, for putting yourself out there in front of the formation and telling your men and yeah. that this is what you need to do. And so because of that, I'd like to present you with this board. I really appreciate that. And, and now you stick that on your uniform. Would you wear it? Probably no. not. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, my, my tattoos, honestly, are my, my badges. Like yeah. so every, every, my, my tattoos all... all um, come from like a, a place mostly of trauma and like this is how how i dealt with them how i dealt with that trauma um so yeah i guess i, I get i made my own badges you know mm-hmm. put on my skin but I, I think just to go back to your point you know that being vulnerable put yourself out there the, the poetry like we're still always competing with with kit picks you know what i mean with yeah, like picks of dudes because right? it's like i i could spend like hours and i guess it's just like me going on a tangent but like i, I could write this like really powerful thing in my mind and, and I put it out there and I'm like, man, maybe I should have put a picture of myself up in kit. Yeah. Like maybe, maybe more people would read it. And so like, I struggle with this. this no, because then they like the photo instead yeah, of, exactly. Right. Yeah. you're right though. Yeah. I, I struggle yeah. with this exact same thing running social media, even for men, mentors from military. I can put what I even think is a cool picture and it doesn't do anything. Yeah. And there are times where I may put a cool picture and I put a message and I still wonder, is it a photo? Or yeah, was, it the, or was it the writing? Yeah, because I don't get very many comments. I begin to really think it okay, must have been the photo. So you, you know, you know what I've heard though is that you shouldn't worry about. And this is what I try to tell myself: don't worry about the the amount of like likes and the amount of you know, I guess in the algorithm, how you know how big the post gets, but about all the people that read it and don't like it and yeah. don't don't post anything on it, but that you've affected. So that's what I always try to tell myself: is that it, it's okay if I only have a certain amount of followers or you know a certain amount of traction on a post, because there's people out there probably got something from it and you know hopefully it affected someone enough you know that maybe it set them on a course to try yoga or meditation or you know try to get some some help are we starting to see more as part of the therapy from post-traumatic stress within the active component um of maybe hey go go do some therapy you know and see if it will help you in terms of meditation and you know are you seeing, I mean, in other words, you know, yeah. yoga is still not like widely accepted. I'm just curious yeah. to know if, if it's starting to catch on even with the active duty as a, as a mode of possibly grounding yourself and getting yeah. your stuff together. You know, I, I mean, I'd say like in my, I guess, three foot world, um, that I haven't seen a major shift in people wanting to seek out therapy. Uh, what I have seen is my counselor has gotten a lot busier in the past, 
you know, over the past six months or so. And, yeah. you know, she books out now. So I would take that as a sign that there's, that there's more people that are seeking I would definitely help. take that as a positive. Yeah. yeah. But, but what I would say, like in my, in my like scope or my yeah. sphere, I, I haven't really seen a you know, major shift in people that are actually reaching out for help from a counselor. I think it's there though. It's like, a, it's on the tip of the tongue. I yeah. mean, resiliency is a big, that's like the big thing in the military now is how do we build more resiliency into our service members? And I, I know that the, the training's becoming more yeah. accessible. It, it's mandatory. Oh, that, I think that's the issue that I was just thinking about, yeah. like so, something like MRT, Ma, was it yeah, master, master resiliency training? training? Yeah. Like it, it becomes a write off, right? So there's, yeah. there's really good techniques in it. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of like there Eastern are. philosophy in yeah. that's infused in MRT. But when you make it something where it's an additional duty for somebody yeah, that, may or, yeah. that may or that may or may not be doing it, so he can get get promoted, make so he yeah. can make a seven or something, or make yeah. an eight, you know, and you've got guys that are in the class that are there because they have to be there. Well, yeah. well then you probably have a lot of guys that are tuned. I'm, I'm one of them. Like yeah. you tune yeah, out same. from it, you know. Same. So like, if there was a different, I mean, I don't know the answer. Like we, it's all the online training, and you know, we we get we get blind to it or nose blind, yeah. you know. Yeah, the, the online training I think is a mistake. That that sucks. Yeah, Man. I do. We we had one guy in the platoon and he did all of it. <laughs> we just here's here's the next cat card. I think everybody does that. I think, right? I think that's probably pretty common yeah. throughout the military. He did my TBI survey like a few months after he got a massive TBI. So I, I, I hope know. who knows where my baseline's supposed dude, to be. <laughs> and that like that to me like exemplifies the yeah. like the problem with the system. I yeah. just hope there's a general listening right now who's in <laughs> yeah. charge who's in charge of online training for the army or for the military and can can just tank it. I mean, you're just phoning it in. Yeah, I know it's effective and efficient. I should say efficient, not necessarily effective. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. We have the resources. We can do a little better. I think yeah. people learn in different ways, sure. you know, for sure. Um, I mean, some people are not good at tests. Some people are better at, you know, you know, reading the material and stuff and absorbing it, but not just not taking the test. They feel too much under pressure. Or Some people are really good test takers, but they're not really good at paying attention in the classroom. And, you know, there, there, are, different, <laughs> there are different types of people that are definitely out there in learning styles. But I think the issue is when you make it mandatory, when you, anytime you force something upon someone who, who may not be willing to do it, the odds are better that they're not going to do it for the yeah. right reasons. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, I've gone into situations where I was forced to do it. Um, you know, one of them was a sense of therapy. And um, coming out of it, uh, even after the first session, it was so cathartic that I wanted more. Really? And yeah, and so for me, it was, you know, this is something I want to do, but I didn't go out there and continue it and try to look at, well, maybe there's another modality. Maybe I need to take this to a different level or whatever. I just thought what I was getting was what I needed at the time. Yeah. And it did definitely help, but I like that you guys are looking at so many different ways in order to attack it. Um, again, I know I'm kind of, kind of going full circle again, but to, to me, I think in today's age, everybody learns differently. Everybody is different. One thing may not work. You may even have to use multiple times. And God bless you if one does. Yeah. And if you find the right one, because we kind of talked about the Holy Grail, but like we were also talking about, you know, equine therapy and, you know, Paul's really big into that and, you know, the horse therapy and everything. And, and yet this person that was on a previous show was talking about how they may infuse yoga it, along with it yeah. um, and to tack it, tackle it as, okay, when you have your downtime, now that you're not working with the horse, now that you have your downtime, do some yoga, you know, meditate, ground yourself again, even more, you know. I, I like that. I like the the idea of one size doesn't fit all. Yeah, I, I think you have to kind of deshroud, or I don't know if the word, or word unshroud, take the shroud off of like the mystery of all, all, all these things. Like I hadn't heard about equine therapy until I had a good buddy that got out after you know twenty something years, and he's like he was you know messed up. Yeah. He found equine therapy and was like, holy shit, like this is this is a like my life has changed. And he got into all kinds of different like spiritual practices, like from like the healing he got in equine therapy. Yeah. Um, like talking to it, talking to, you know, therapists, like nobody, it's still kind of taboo. You don't really talk about it. You know, the army, the army says, yeah, if you reach out, if you need, yeah, but they don't, you know, they don't really mean it. No, nah, <laughs> they don't really mean it. And they don't tell you what it's Come like. On, Paul, then we're kind of killing the whole concept. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't tell you what to expect. You know, they don't tell you like yeah. what, you know, yoga, like, yo, like there could be a, a, you know, a leadership team or someone that, that would talk about, Hey, you know, yoga could help. There's therapeutic yoga. Nobody's going to go to it. Yeah. You know, it's, 
I don't know what that what that you know magic bullet is to to help change that conversation within the military. I can tell you, you know, like we talked about earlier, you know, I I think one of the best ways outside of it is for us to be talking about it openly, like we're doing. Uh, inside the military, it's tough because you know, even if we've, like I saw a meme, it was like this is is like someone's face being like really frustrated when the army is telling you to do something army related, even though yeah. you joined the army, you know, on purpose. <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of that's kind of like what what it's like when somebody tells you to go to go to therapy, go to yoga, whatever. Like if somebody tells me to do something, ah, like yeah. if it doesn't align with like where I'm at. Or even if it does, and somebody tells me to do it, I might not even do it because I'm being told to do it. As his business partner, I, will, uh, <laughs> I agree with that statement. Yeah. I told my wife last night because my kids, my kids are really tough, and they're like really stubborn, and yeah. like we'll tell them to do things, they'll do it their own way. And I told my wife, I was like, I've never taught them that, but I'm telling you, it's 100 percent how I am. Like if a rule doesn't make sense to me, I'm probably gonna break it. Yeah. But sorry to all my command. It's uh, it's uh, I think hard for people to realize, especially when they have kids, that whatever you did and however you are, that DNA did get passed. Oh, You're yeah. probably gonna experience <laughs> yeah. it again, maybe even on steroids. Yeah. You know? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. My brother can attest. And and our dad can look at us and say, "Well, there I am." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where that old saying of "You are your father's son." Hundred oh, yes. percent, yeah, thousand percent, yeah. And we see it all across the board. Um, yeah, I I think that you know as time goes on, I want to believe that things will improve. But I do worry about if we start forcing it in or putting it out there in a certain way where it sounds like we're forcing people to do things that they may resist and it may get worse. So yeah. we've got to be very careful of the direction we're going and how we're approaching, you know, this conversation around post traumatic stress and and how you can get the right type of healing. Because if there's anything we've all learned by being in the military, it's that they'll screw it up if they can find a way because they'll <laughs> overemphasize things and they put too much and or they'll use a canned approach so that they can put it in a PowerPoint presentation and slide it across the whole entire uh, force, yeah. you yeah. know, and, and feel like that's going to be the answer. Yeah, I feel like it's OK, though. Honestly, I think like just put it out there like when when they're when the individual's ready, at least they know where to look and they know where to turn. That's kind of how I see it. And, you know. You know, you can't determine that as a, a leader or as somebody that's in charge of another person. Like, you can't really decide when they need help unless it's like a rock bottom situation or a, a substance abuse situation. Sure. Like, that yeah. stuff manifests and you can intervene at that point. But I think it kind of just doesn't matter. Make it known that it's available. Yeah. And the people that are open to it and willing to do it, I mean, nobody's going to make you go and do yoga. That's not really physically possible to do and that's not so, who, who i'd want in the studio anyway yeah you know some of this force is going to approach it from a whole different yeah, it's not going to work yeah. you know then they'll just sit there and sandbag so just let them know it's there yeah and i think it i think the rest kind of takes care of itself i mean these are strong-willed self-determining determining individuals yeah i got marble mouth today rob yeah <laughs> what what i would say to you to, to kind of build on that is that I, I would like to see the conversation change where you don't just go to yoga if you're dealing with post-traumatic stress. You don't just go to yoga if you're dealing with an injury. You don't just go to talk to a therapist when you've hit rock bottom. But the, these are all preventative therapies as well. It's an oil change. Yeah. It's just It's maintenance. Yeah, yeah it's, it's maintenance. So then when, when those situations do come up, like you're better prepared to deal with them. You know, you're more equipped. I think it's as a society that we're almost taught to be reactive rather than proactive. And, and I don't know where that comes from, but we tend to not look at um, ways we can do I mean, preventative medicine, we're, we're really trying, that was a buzzword that came out in several years ago. People heard it, but they don't really understand the benefits of it. Now though, some people think, okay, well then I'll go get this preventative medicine, but now insurance says, oh, well forget that. We're not going to cover it. So it, it's the way we approach things. And so we typically don't go to the doctor unless we're ailing. Yeah. We don't go to the physical therapist unless we're really bad and we just can't move our body. We don't want to go, um, you know, to um, uh, a doctor or a friend or anything like that unless we hit rock bottom. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it, my mind just went to, uh, I remember I had a drill sergeant, like I, I went to, to sick call and because I had poison ivy like all over my arm and I just wanted some calamine or something. Yeah. And the drill sergeant like chewed me out, like, Call me a pussy. Like, what are you doing? Going to going to sick car? Yeah. Like, All right. I'm, I'm I'm not going anymore. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna deal with it. But that was like right at the start. Oh man. You know, like you're talking about building a culture. Like we have a culture of don't go to the doc. Oh you damn. Know, don't go to the medics. Like, yeah. Take some ibuprofen. And Water. There's a, there's a balance to be struck, right? Like you need to be tough because you got to go through these austere environments and do these hard things. And you got to be able to like 
withstand hardship, but like you, you have value and like yeah. you're, you're going to be a lot more valuable and effective if you're in good health and hey. taking care of yourself, <laughs> yeah. you know? It's, so it's like, yeah, I mean, I kind of get, you know, cause everybody that went through basic went through the same thing. You had to, you don't want to be sick call ranger. Yeah. You got to tough it up. It's the first time most of well, those kids ever experienced any real hardship yeah. or many of them. Yeah. But like yeah. You still like you need to be in good health so you can be effective. Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. It's weird, man. It's weird. It's like, like you were saying, like, like a, it's, it's an oil change, you know, like you're before you deploy your M4 it goes to the armor and they scope it and check it out and make sure it's all good to go. And when you come back, it goes back to the armor. Yeah. It doesn't matter how well it functioned while you were out there shooting. It doesn't matter if it ran flawlessly. It still goes to the arms room to get inspected, but you don't, you just fill out the checklist when you get home. Your PDHA. You do your PDHA yeah. and lie through your teeth so that you can go on leave on time without talking to some other lady yeah. on, you know, in the, PD, in the SRP or yeah, whatever my, it's called. It wasn't until my second deployment that I started telling the truth on those forms. I never did, yeah. man. Never. Never, see, ever See did. that right there. Yeah. So, I feel great. So I they're, they're trying to come back to us. Nothing's going on. They're trying to figure out a way to, to head this yeah. off and, and be proactive and get engaged yeah. and all of this. But then look, look what you guys are just talking about. <laughs> yeah. you, you figure out a way to maneuver through the system because what you last thing you want when you come out of a deployment is to have to remain back in this environment. I want to go see my family, my friends and yeah. get, get out of this space. Yeah. But it, it's supposed to be a preventive measure, or at least a measure of which uh, before potentially something happens bigger. Yeah. And it's catching some people, you know? I yeah, mean, but if it's, it's only a filter. It's not, it's not nothing. It's, yeah. It's pretty well, close, though. The Space Force has the opportunity to do it right. I mean, they're, start, they're starting from scratch, yeah. right? Like they, they, can, they can set the culture now. Yeah. So my, my hope would be with the newest branch of the military. <laughs> I, I don't know about the army. I don't know if we're going to get there. You'll get a kick out of this because we were talking about it uh, offline, I think it was, where I'd, I had done a uh, show down at Warrior Training Center with the pre-ranger course that they had that they host and stuff for the National Guard and other branches and all that kind of stuff. And we were having a conversation, and they mentioned that, um, uh, you know, other services come through, international, and um, that they just had someone from Space Force come through. And I said, Space really? Ranger? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Space Space what course they going to do? Tell you? Yeah, they, they went to the uh, the one at Benning. The it Warrior, was the pre. Uh, it was the pre Ranger. So then they went no to Ranger shit. School. So there is a awesome. there is a yeah. Space Ranger right now. If the space, space Ranger Force. is out there. And <laughs> yeah. You're listening. We want to talk. I, I we definitely want you want to on the Space Ranger. No, I, I want the, I want to know who that person is. We want that person on this uh, this podcast. I'm yeah. going to do my best to try to do <laughs> that. So many questions. Yeah, I really all the questions. envy. <laughs> so envious. <laughs> <laughs> Does the music like all kick on and everything? Space, <laughs> my kid. I don't uh, yeah, know. I don't, did you guys watch that show and everything? What's that? The Space Ranger. I don't Wasn't know if I ever saw Space Ranger. Space Ranger. I don't. That's oh. a show. I think Buzz Lightyear was a was a Space yeah, Ranger. Buzz so that's was a Space Ranger. Ranger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How is it that the um, how, how does I'm curious in your line of work, Mike? How is the um, police force and, and EMS and, and trauma centers and stuff like how are they attacking post traumatic stress? So that's a, that's a great question because I'm sitting here listening and, you know, and just being part of American Yogi, I've heard, I've been, I've been talked around uh, about this subject. And I have to say, I'm impressed with the way that both active and the veteran communities are doing this. You're having the conversations. I can tell you right now in the hospital world, right inside the hospital, this does not happen at all really at all does not happen. We have psychologists, psychiatrists in the hospital and it's for the patients. Never happens. Wow. On the fire and EMS side, thankfully they've done a fan. So that this is, these are pre hospital people. So fire, fire and, and, and EMS sometimes are together and also police. They have people that come in and, and they're able to help that way. Um, we, we have a, we have a really great friend, uh, who has taught yoga. I don't know how many times to, you know, different fire departments around the country, uh, actually a few friends that do that. Um, so on the, on the EMS side, it's happening. The conversations aren't so much, but at least the physical stuff has started. Um, and then maybe that will broaden people's minds into where the, where they go next. But I'm telling you inside the hospital, nurses, paramedics, physicians, nurse practitioners, you name it. Especially at major trauma centers. Doesn't happen. I mean, we have one here, Grady, you know, mm -hmm. downtown Atlanta. Yeah. I mean, they're they're probably one of the best. They absolutely are. 
And um, I would hope, I mean, I would hope that somebody's having that type of conversation, you know, and trying to seek out and find ways to, you know, to see if there's trauma there that they can impact in some ways through one of these modalities that we talked about, uh, counselor uh, or sure. you know, whatever. I'm sure somewhere in every hospital, there's someone whose job it is to do that. Yeah. I'm not aware of it. What's what I picked up on that too is that if there is a single person, you're talking about a 200, 400 bed hospital, which means a lot of physicians, a lot of nurses, and everything, and people in general just walking around that perform various functions within that hospital building and environment. And that's hard in and of itself. But if you don't have that mindset and you don't have that leadership and that culture, within that building, that one person is not going to be that effective anyway. Sure, sure. And I think that's what we found within the military is that so long as we had the senior officers and NCOs saying, if you go on sick call, you're basically a dirt bag. And then they were also not wanting to talk about the difficult struggles within their life. They were compounding and making it harder and suppressing that and compartmentalizing it within those individuals that were feeling the pain that needed the help. So, I mean, I, I would hope that the conversation that we're having here becomes more of just a conversation within society, you know, and we look at these opportunities because the stigmas can't be just broke within the or, or healed within the, the military. Because when we talk about trauma, like we did with you, Mike, even in your profession and we're talking about now, it's, it's across all. Yeah. I, th I think part of what you're talking about too is this, the civ male divide, right? Like we, if we start, if we keep talking about ourselves as being so separate and so different, Us and them, then, yes. yeah, yeah. Then, then we're just, we're perpetuating it. But if we have a con like this conversation is awesome. Like to, to be able to, to talk on both sides of the wall, like we're bringing the communities together and, you know, hopefully people see and start realizing that we're a lot more alike than we thought. I can tell you from being somebody that's been on the outside for a period of time that that's one of the things that drives me insane is when I hear veterans um, especially still refer to a, or comment in ways that it's like an us and them. It's like you, yeah. you're not helping the situation at all. You know, we, we've got to actually have more conversation, and I wish there would be more positive com conversation through uses of or through the use of like social media and the things that we were talking about through poems, through things like that, that really put that out there and use the platform in maybe a better way than what they even thought they would design it for. Because they thought they'd, I mean, we've got influencers, uh, influencers or so-called influencers within yeah. social media who are really just trying to rack up more followers so they can make, monetize it in some way, they can make some money yeah. and, and not necessarily for all the right reasons that you think they are. And they may be kind of living this whole facade, you know, putting this facade out there. I'm not saying all, but I, I think that there are quite I a few. I don't know why you're looking right at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So, well, because sometimes yeah. you're my devil's advocate. I you look know, you know. good in a bikini and I like <laughs> don't judge me. But I, yeah. I, I do think that there's a real opportunity here to spread the word and get it across a whole lot better. And again, it doesn't matter what walk of life you are. It doesn't matter what happened, whether it's military sexual trauma or sexual trauma within the private sector, you know, and civilian side and everything, or whether it's um, something that happened within your childhood, a major event that occurred, or it's something that happened in a combat zone. We're probably more alike in all types of different ways on this topic than what people realize and having that kind of conversation, you know, I, I've heard police force in some um, a particular area and stuff say things like, well, you don't know what we went through. We don't, yeah. You don't know what we're – you're not police. You know, you're a veteran. It's very different. Well, there are probably a lot of similarities, and you're someone, Mike, that knows that. You know, sure. that, like we're talking about here. You can, let's find – you know what? Let's find the common ground. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's something a lot of you – know, speaking from the active duty side about, you know, about to be a veteran um, – one of the struggles that, that that I've had over the past few years, I guess, is, is isolating myself from people that don't understand my experience. And yeah. I'm talking about old friends. I'm talking about family. Like, I mean, you could ask my brother. There was there was stretches I'd go through where I wouldn't talk to family for months on end because yeah. I didn't know how to talk to anyone that, that didn't understand what I was dealing with. Um, but one of the things I'm working through right now is is you know realizing and I'm getting better at it as time goes on that it doesn't matter if that person has had the same experiences or not. Like we're human. 
you know, we can, we can always connect with another human on a, you know, on a social level and, you know, they see you as you are, you come as you are, you're, you're honest and, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter. It matters. It matters because, you know, it's helps shape who you are, but when it comes down to it, we're all just trying to, to connect and find our place, yeah. be yeah. seen. Robert, I think we're rebranding you today. Why is that? I don't think it's mentors for mill. I think it's mentors from mill. Right? Um, it's not just I actually thought about that. It doesn't, it's period. not as, it's not as catchy. <laughs> no, 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 but you're, so I don't know that I, if I shared this with you off, uh, off air or anything, but I, I was talking to somebody, um, it may have been somebody earlier, but I struggle when I first picked the name, everybody thought, Oh, that's great. And then as time went on, I really struggle with this. Is that the right name? You know? And because I think there are, there are, we could change it. But you can also change it however you see it too, right? Because that's kind of what we're talking about. Get from it what you want. If you want it to be mentors from military instead of mentors for military, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, that's pretty yeah. cool. Uh, because I think that's it's still hitting on what the the vision was and and what we wanted to do and the premise and of the show and everything. Um, and I again, I told you at the very beginning, Mike. I just really appreciate yourself and others who didn't live within the veteran space. You know finding common ground within the show, you know, and that's kind of what we're talking about. Let's find more commonality. Let's find, you know, that space that where we can all kind of, you know, live within and have conversation then and dialogue. Um, and I think we could move faster than what perhaps we're trying to think of ways now we can do that. You know, I mean, we could, we could really blow this out of the water. Yeah. I want I want you guys though, to really talk about, where you guys are, you know, the movement and, you know, so people don't have to go back and listen to the previous show. Where, where can they find you guys and all that kind of good stuff? Yeah. So the e easiest way to, to find us is, is social media, Instagram, um, live American Yogi, um, spelled exactly how it sounds. Um, our website, live American Uh, you can always reach out to us. Uh, Instagram is probably the quickest way. Um, right now, so we, we've been doing this over the past few years as a passion project. Um, but now with, with me transitioning out, it's going to be, it's going to be full time. Uh, so the, the opportunities to get out in the community more, the opportunities to uh, connect more with, you know, different, different communities, I think is going to be uh, ramped up, but I will have more time on my hands as well. Um, and, you know, I'm always open. So the way, the way it kind of works, so I'm the, I'm the front of the house, American Yogi and, and, and Mike is kind of the, the, the backbone, the, the back of the house. So if you reach out, um, it'd be me that you're reaching out to, but so you're the all, chef that makes it all happen. And he just greets the customers that's it. to the door. Just, to, yeah, just hand it off. That's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> but, but Mike is always, and, and, I, and I've said this before, like Mike's always available too. like his, his range of experience. Like we're not just for the veteran community. And that's something that I would stress too is American Yogi is for everybody. I just happen to be you know, a service member. Um, you know, Mike brings to the table a whole, a whole range of experience. And, you know, I, I think that especially EMS community, the, the LEO community, like that. I, I think there's a space for everyone in American Yogi. Um, so yeah, you can always reach out to either one of us and find us on social media. It's been really fun to watch you guys, um, especially since you've been on the show, because I've seen in several of your stories or maybe even your posts, people who've been on this show now connecting with yeah. you. And, that, and that's kind of cool to watch because I think um, what I love a lot about this podcast is the the connection of veterans because we're each doing something different in our own world and you know i have a life outside of the podcast and and um you guys are doing certain things and if i can connect you with this person or this they just find you because they listen to the episode oh, yeah. and i mean that's what it's all about is you know that network is your net worth kind of conversation, Absolutely. you know, and, and you're building that network and stuff. I mean, there, there's a whole mentors for mill network that I That's think awesome. be, being on the show has, has like allowed me access to. And it's been amazing because okay. I connected with so many people that, that I, I wouldn't have probably spoken to had I not been on the show and people that are super interesting and you make me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm trying to blushing. get trying to get show three. Right? I'm trying to get the third, a third episode. Well, on what we ought to do is come to, to North Carolina <laughs> or yeah. Florida in a few months. Or Florida. Yeah, that's I, right. I like Florida more. Yeah, yeah, I do too. <laughs> I like Florida a lot. Yeah, 
It sounds like we need to do an episode in Florida. You know, head down to the Tampa St. Pete area That's right. and such. And you we can just film me and Rob in yoga pants. And, and no, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I practice in silkies. It makes you feel better. <laughs> what is that? Sweet. Silkies. Ranger. Oh, silkies. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I didn't. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, I had this weird thought in my head. I don't know what. I don't want to tell you. But like, any rate, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just got weird. So, yeah. so are we going to be sitting there, and you're going to be doing the beat and the drum, and I, then I might. we're going to do like maybe you know you talked about something. I forget what it was earlier in the show and i was going to bring it up about the pregnant pause and about taking the breath and yeah. thinking it, it, even as a host of this show i i'm a person i can't stand pregnant pauses and everything yeah um they drive me insane uh because i need somebody to talk and even if i'm like on a zoom call or whatever and i go hey joe joe <laughs> Yeah, I think that the issue here, Robert, and I'm like, oh, my God, where have you been, man? It's like 40 <laughs> seconds there, you know? It kills me, right? Yeah. And uh, so I could I could totally uh, see us doing a show, and hopefully everybody would tune in, where we would just sit here for two minutes and just watch the counter go. <laughs> just breathe. That, that doesn't sound that compelling. It does. It does. It doesn't make for good radio. Yeah. So yeah. what we'll do is we need to do visual media. On right, that. right. So we'll have we'll have the we'll have Phil doing the do the, bowl. the bowl or you know yeah. like, yeah. those are cool, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah I like the bowl. Do you, do you whip out the uh, the what's the 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 the, the yeah, little the, harp? What I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, what the hell is those things called? I had called? one as a kid and I yeah. couldn't play it, but I know exactly mouth what you're talking harp about. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You whip out that? I don't. I don't whip out the mouth harp. I did buy a drum. I'd buy a drum and I bought. I have a bowl that somebody sent me my a couple of points. Drum meaning like bong? Uh, like you hit with it, a... Oh. It's like a... They call it like a comfort sound therapy drum. My therapist used oh. it, so I liked okay. it. And I use it for my kids, and they love it. I didn't have That's, that as a kid. Yeah. I had one yeah. of those that had the little things on each side, so you twist it. Mm-hmm. And th- had that, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Do you really? Is that part <laughs> yeah. of the therapy? Really? No, no. That's my kids. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't have told them. We could have, we could have them going, man. <laughs> like, here, try this. <laughs> Give them some random... <laughs> like you're doing it right, Rob. Yeah, yeah. do it great. perfect. Don't take pictures and put it with the podcast. Yeah. All right. Oh, well, before I let you go, are you guys uh, offering online? No, I know how much we just talked about how you hate online stuff, but are you? No, doing no, I don't. I don't. I don't hate online stuff yeah, at okay. all. Okay. <laughs> I think. I'll, yeah, I'll preface that with. Um, I think it's how it's like you said. It's how you use social media. Yeah, and and we try to use it in a positive way. Um, but we like do videos have, though. Like, can I do a beginner's? Yeah. So. We have uh, videos on our site, live American Yogi dot L I V E American Yogi dot com. Um, and I also starting probably the next month or so, we'll start producing flows, uh, you know, classes that, that I'll be teaching for the website and for social media. So tune in uh, okay. from, from no matter where you're at your practice, whether it's, you know, beginners or you've been practicing for a while. The space. Yeah. The idea is to keep the facility in North Carolina as well as in Tampa, or what's the plan? Closing down the uh, oh, the man, warehouse in North hearts. Carolina, and we're yeah, and we're opening up. I mean, I'm leaving my studio where I started teaching, so that'll that'll be yeah. tough. And that community there is in Southern Pines is unbelievable. Um, well, and that was a kind of a. Uh, I think what was um, nice about it is that you were hitting a target rich area oh, yeah. of the, of that sar- uh, soft community, you know? And yeah. I mean, we get, there's group guys in the class constantly. I think more than anybody else from like, we get some conventional guys out there from 80 second boys, but for the most part, I'd say we get yeah. guys that are either in the Q course or that, have, mm. that are, you know, prepping for deployment or like, huge community. And it, it's, it's amazing to see, you know, the SF community embracing yoga and Southern Pine so so deeply. It's it's awesome, and it, it, you're right. It's a target rich environment. So we'll see what happens in, in uh, Florida. But what I will say is, when when uh, we do relocate the company down to Florida, we'll still be traveling. You know, mm-hmm. we still will have our festival in North Carolina. You know, we still will uh, will attend festivals and do classes and retreats all over the the world really in the country we'll link up at some point we'll do a travel thing and what we yeah. do is we'll get an audience together and we'll do yoga and then a podcast let's and then a, do it yeah let's sign me up I'm, yeah i'm game i'm there yeah. yeah yeah and then we'll go down the range i'm wearing yoga shoot. pants but i gotta it, see this weird. i just you know it's funny i was just telling my brother so uh ian strimbeck runs uh, yeah. rune nation so yeah. so i was talking to ian a little while ago and we were talking about maybe doing like a run gun and flow kind of kind of a oh. day where they That's would do cool. you do like a, a gun day with Ian, and then you yeah. have me have me for the end of the day to unwind after after working. Oh, it's very it's funny cool. that you say that. It's yeah, like, hey. that's something we were talking about. No, Ian was on the me, show as well, so let me know when you do that. I want to come. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's it's an idea at this point, yeah. but I think I think Ian was was stoked about it too. Yeah, we share memes on the daily. Cool. So I'll, I'll I wonder if uh, I wonder if you could do two days. You do 
gun before the flow and then flow before the gun and that's see not a bad idea at all there's a, oh, the oh, meditation like part of that especially for breathing i'm gonna bring you into the planning session <laughs> <laughs> yeah, done. i'm happy to yeah when we did when we did uh we did griffin group a while back and, and it was like a pistol course and he was talking yeah. he was doing like all right now close your eyes and you know, imagine where you hit and and then throw it in throw it in the shredder and i was like we're doing meditation right now you know we're doing visualization yeah. like we're there yeah. there's so much there, there's so much carryover so. yeah there so, really is and so i could definitely see that you know, especially, you know, like I was talking about it earlier that, you know, when you think about the the range and you do the breathing techniques and stuff in order to hit the target. Well, if you really practice that, you know, I could. You I, have to. That's why you feel so good it's after the range. range. Yeah. Because you've been meditating for hours yeah. when you're on the range. So it yeah. makes sense. Now it's all coming together and everybody gets it. Yeah. yeah. There you Conversations go. changed. <laughs> we did Secrets it. exposed. We did it. <laughs> You should have just said that at the beginning of the podcast, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> then they wouldn't have listened all the way to the end. Yeah. Mike, yeah. Bill, thank you both for coming. No, it's a pleasure. Really thank appreciate you. it. Wish you nothing but the best as you head down there. And I'm serious, at some point we'll have to catch back up again. There'll be a, another Definitely. number three or right. we'll do something um, along those lines because uh, it's always a good time when you guys come into the podcast and bring what you guys are doing and helping other veterans and, you know, Really appreciate that too. I mean, you're making a difference. I guess is what I'm trying to say, whether you realize it or not. I appreciate that. It's a, it, and I tell, I tell, I say this all the time. It's it's a privilege. It's an absolute privilege to to have a voice in this community. So and I thank you for for having us on and letting us letting us have a voice here. Too easy. Oh, yeah. yeah. I hope I hope that uh, people get something out of it. <laughs>